You're listening to the Valley Labor Report with David Story and Jacob Morrison. So today we are talking to Jonah Furman. He previously worked in labor organizing for Bernie Sanders and AOC. We're going to be talking to him about his new newsletter. Jonah, thanks for talking to us. I appreciate your time. Thanks for having me. Great show. Uh, thank you very much. I appreciate it. So, Jonah, tell us about your newsletter. What what are you trying What are you trying to do in this in in this new newsletter? Sure. Yeah. Just started uh, in earnest this year. Uh, it's called Who Gets the Bird. Substack. Com is where you can subscribe to it for free or chip in. Um, yeah. It's you know the hope is basically to do two things. One is to keep an eye on the actually existing labor movement. There used to be in this country a robust labor press. Things would, you know, big union conventions would be front page news in national newspapers. Local union activity would be front page news in local news. There would be union papers in different industries, different shops, you know, big factories would have their own paper. States would have their statewide labor paper written by, you know, union members and organizers and things like that. So to some extent, I'm just trying to track all the stuff that I track personally of what's going on in the U.S. labor movement that's not being tracked anymore uh, and share it out and have people keep your finger on the pulse of what's happening. I, I feel like a lot of our labor writing or, you know, academia, it's history, right? We talk about things that happened 50 years ago or more, and there's very little sense of what's happening this week, this month. Um, and the other part of it is, you know, so I po post these weekly updates that are, you know, too ambitious. We try and put in everything that has happened that week uh, in terms of union organizing in the U.S., but also uh, work on longer form essays, critical views, things like that. I think another thing we've missed because we've lost this labor press and all of this is somewhat downstream from losing, you know, a big labor movement mm -hmm. is we've lost people talking about what should the labor movement be doing or what's changed or what did it used to be like or you know, what are the actual existing tensions? We all know we're, we're all pro-union and it's an extremely, you know, obviously pro-union newsletter I put out, but it's not enough to just cheer on the union. Obviously, things haven't been going great for, you know, depending how you count it, 40 years for the U.S. labor movement. And I think getting a little more deep into that with examples that aren't historical but are contemporary is really key for anybody who wants to organize or even just understand what's going on with the unions today, whether you, you know, are a union worker, you want to organize a union at your, at your place of work, or you're a political operative, wherever you are on that spectrum, if you don't understand what's going on in the labor movement today, I don't think you have much of a chance of intervening in any way, whether that's locally or on a national scale. Right, right, and you said that you, uh, you know, you're trying to track what's going on. What are the uh, the the things that you that you bring out in your newsletter? Yeah, so the weekly, I mean, these weekly updates really are. I, I lead heavily with new organizing, and that's partly just my opinion on what has to happen in the labor movement, right? Like, if we're not organizing new shops, you can do the math however you want. But for example, in 2020, we lost 323,000 union jobs, and in January of this year through new organizing, we organized something like 2,000 new union jobs. Mm -hmm. So if you do the math, it's never, we're, we're going to zero and we've been going to zero slowly. So I lead with new organizing, which means I try and do a comprehensive list of every new shop that's filed for an election with the Labor Relations Board, uh, you know, in the private sector. These are shops across the country from two workers working as mechanics to 200 workers in a white collar legal firm, whoever it is, all over, uh, every union. And I also track, um, you know, votes that happen. So with the NLRB, you might know you file for an election. Six weeks later, if you're lucky, you get a vote. Usually it's more like a couple months. Um, and sometimes it's years. So just tracking that is a project in itself. And then besides that is trying to get people a feel for what's going on in local unions across the country. So in our labor movement as it exists, you have every union puts out a national press release each week on some piece of legislation or something that happened in the news or they're weighing in in some way. But to get the real flavor of what's going on in the labor movement you know, on the ground floor where there's actual workers participating as opposed to kind of, you know, people writing press releases, which are, are useful, but don't give you the real flavor. Uh, you know, you kind of just have to keep your eye on local news across the country. So there's 
more than you realize there's strike authorization votes happening here and there this week just off the top of my head you know we're looking at 700 uh, truck drivers in arizona have authorized a strike uh, for a grocery distributor there uh, hundreds of nurses in massachusetts are talking about a strike authorization last week there was a small school district outside pittsburgh that was on strike they went back to work without a contract things like this if you don't know that that's happening or you can't track that that's going on it's really hard to get a sense beyond you know national headlines of what is the labor movement so we're all watching amazon in alabama following every twist and turn and i love it i love that the new york times is writing about it mm-hmm. but they're not writing about you know thousands of other workers who are taking action and whose lives are being transformed by the labor movement in real time um, and it's just being missed on a national level because it's all local stories it's it's interesting john this is david good morning john good to see hey, you again uh yeah it's interesting what you say about the new york times writing about it and you know of course writing about amazon and not so much everything else and that's kind of you know uh, me growing up in in like the underground metal and punk scene i kind of look at uh, make that make that uh that the the two combine in, in other words when i was growing up this whole underground scene we everybody that was in the scene knew about it and we had you know people that wrote little articles and and passed out flyers and things like that and that's and i'm looking at the labor movement now and, and specifically like your newsletter and like strike wave that that's that uh publishes a lot of things and we all know about those things but they're but it's almost like this underground scene of my teenage years everybody that you know i follow you you follow me kim kelly all the brothers and sisters in the labor movement but it's not getting any mainstream traction Hmm. and i wonder you know and you may not be the person to answer this but i'm going to ask the question anyways if you could speak to what do we have to do i mean like you said at the beginning a lot i mean you know a lot of the major newspapers and some of the minor ones uh, you know 40 years ago had an entire section devoted to organized labor and and it's moved and i I know a lot of it's because the internet uh has has taken those funds out of the out of the print media but we've got to do something and i don't know i don't know exactly what we've got to do because i feel like a lot of the reason, not a lot, but a partial, a portion of the reason the labor movement is not moving forward is because nobody covers it in mainstream media whatsoever. What do you think, you know, in, in your opinion? I mean, like I say, your, your, your newsletter, your substack is absolutely amazing. That It's data-driven. It's very intellectually written. But, I mean, and not, not a knock on you, but there's no, there's no, uh, there's no way for you to get that out to everybody that really needs to see it. Right. I mean, well, I'll say this. The New York Times was not writing about, you know, the auto workers convention in the 40s because they were such fans of labor. Exactly. It's because they were a threat. So, you know, it's not even a threat, a social force. Right. So to even soften it, it's not even that conspiratorial. It's just it mattered to people because the unions were powerful. So to some extent, I'm like, you know, this is such a frustrating answer and it's what everything boils down to in the labor movement, as you say, until we're, we got the power back, there's, there's not much we can do about these, uh, you know, secondary effects like losing the labor press. But I think, I think it's a chicken and the egg for sure. I think people think there's no labor movement. And I also think that people who want there to be a labor movement uh, whether you're a local union member or a national leader, don't really have this this holistic sense of what's going on in the labor movement. You know, there's kind of a broad strokes kind of thing of, oh, well, you know, NAFTA, we lost jobs and it became a service economy and now it's like all downhill and we're just managing as we can, right? Or we're waiting for labor law to change or something like that. But until we get to big fights that matter to people. I mean, why is the Times covering Amazon? It's because it would really matter. And it's because yeah. Amazon's scared and because Alabama is really interesting for people who think that it's like there's no unions there, right? Or no union members or no workers who fight back there. So part of it is just, it's hard for me to, to you know, it's an excuse, but it's true. <laughs> like the papers covered this stuff when it was 
uh, a threat when we had yeah. when we had the power. So thanks for tuning in, folks. We appreciate your time. Uh, if you want to see what we're up to throughout the week, get our snide quips about the news of the day, then you should follow us on social media. We're on Facebook at facebook.com slash the Valley Labor Report. We're on Twitter at Labor Reporters. I'm on Twitter at Jacob M underscore A L. David is on Twitter at Radical Unionist. That's spelled R A D I C L Unionist. If you miss part of the show and want to go back and watch it later, you can search YouTube for the Valley Labor Report and subscribe to our channel. You can go back and watch the full show there, and we clip segments throughout the week. That way, if there's just one thing that you were interested in, you can watch that without having to watch the whole show. We do upload the program on more than 11 different podcasting apps. So, to see if we are on your listening platform of choice, you can go to thevalleylaborreport.transistor.fm slash subscribe. We have a website, the Valley Labor Report. Org. And if you appreciate our work and want to help us stay on the air, consider throwing us a couple dollars a month on patreon.com slash the Valley Labor Report. And one more thing before we get started to the show, the North Alabama DSA has a necessities drive every Saturday at the IBEW Union Hall on Clinton Avenue across from Campus 805 and Yellowhammer Brewing uh, from 3 to 5 p.m. Uh, this Saturday and every Saturday. So bring PPE, blankets, clothes, non-perishable food items to the North Alabama DSA's Necessities Necessities Drive this Saturday and every Saturday from 3 to 5 p.m. at the IBEW Union Hall on Clinton Avenue. The donations will be sent to the Manor House.